Well, let's start with Johnny because that'll be the briefest. <laughs> Johnny was, you know, I mean, Johnny was, uh, in a sense, you know, if there was a star in the band, that was Johnny. You know. Duke loved Johnny. He was playing. He loved it. personally. They had been together for a very long time, and this, Johnny's another one who was really very young when he joined the band. Uh, they had a tenuous relationship, and you remember, maybe you witnessed this, but when Duke started the medley, you know, when they were playing the medley, which was the medley of Ellington hits, which, by the way, let me digress for a moment. The critics always picked on the medley, you know, they never to believe when somebody reviewed an Ellington concert, they and the medley, the tedious medley. The medley was actually very well put together, and Duke very frequently changed little things in it. And when he played the medley because it meant that he did not have to deal with what would have been the inevitable requests from the audience for solitude, do nothing till you hear from me, mood indigo, whatever, mood indigo was by itself. But that, you know, it's a perfectly sensible thing to do, aside from the fact that he had a perfect right to be proud of all the sits and to play. But the main reason was to prevent all these, especially in live performance. Hey, they're a play sophisticated lady, you know that stuff. You did away with that. There was a very clever way of doing away with it. But the critics always complained about it. Well, let me not get started on critics. That's a different thing. Anyway, uh, so why did I say this? Hodges. Oh. <laughs> Hodges during the Well, Hodges, yes. Well, Hodges during the playing of the medley, if they were wanting, he would start counting money, you know, doing this uh, gesture. <laughs> Very openly, you know, it was clear what he meant. I think Johnny learned his lesson when he left the band and started his own band, his own little band. Uh, it took Sonny Greer with him, which was a blessing as far as Ellington was concerned. As Sonny was the oldest, longest, he was the first one. Uh, Sonny was the one who Really, when that Duke came up from Washington, Sonny was the one who introduced him in Harlem and everything. They were old friends. But by the time that I'm talking about, Sonny had a serious drinking problem, and he'd become a burden. It, it was really, clearly, uh, he was unreliable as in terms of being musically fit. And uh, he had been such an important ingredient in the band. He used to call himself the mix master. Uh, he, with all the little touches and things that he did. But when Johnny took Lawrence, with whom Duke also had a strained personal relationship, and Sonny away, <laughs> it was actually a good deed, although t Johnny was a big loss to the band, and that was the two. For, I mean, Duke would have <laughs> would have kept Sonny in the house, <laughs> not to lose Johnny. But Johnny came back. But what I was saying, the point of it is, when Johnny experienced what it meant to be a band leader, even though it was only a small band, but still, you know, it was a sextet, uh, what that meant, what you had to go through. Uh, I think he learned his lesson, and then he came back to the man, of course, which made Ellington very happy, because that Johnny was irreplaceable. So Johnny was a taciturn guy. He was never unfriendly. He just wasn't very talkative. The longest conversation I ever had with Johnny was about tomatoes. Uh, he said that you can't get a good tomato in New York. You have to grow your own, which he did, and he very proudly said that he, the tomatoes that he grew in his garden were by far the best. You know, the, so we had a nice conversation about tomatoes. I happen to like tomatoes, so it's, uh, uh, but otherwise, you know, he was he was really a quiet guy and or to himself, and. Uh, he was just amazing in terms of what he could do. I mean, that saw that at rehearsals. I mean, he could pick up the horn, you know, uh, usually saxophonist 
fiddle with reeds and everything. He'd pick up the horn, take it out of the case, and put it in his mouth, and boom. Yeah. But he was, you know, Johnny was a kind of genius, you know, with that sound he had. And, uh, you know, when, when Johnny died, which was sudden, you know, he died at his dentist office. You know, Duke was really, you know, very, very shook by that. But what he said about him, we, we printed that in Downbeat. It was beautiful. It wasn't very long, but it was beautiful. Duke had a way with words, as he did with music, you know, that was close to perfection. Uh, so that was a uh, band at the Apollo. I, I loved the Apollo because the Apollo, I think I mentioned this before, there was a special relationship between the performers and the audience. And when Ellington played there, uh, you know, then would come, the, would come the part in the program where he would say, and now, Johnny Hodges, and you know, I should say Johnny Hodges, and Johnny would step out and step to the microphone. First couple of notes out of his horn, all the women in the audience, you could hear a big sigh going up. <sighs> I swear that's true, I'm not making it up. I mean, how could you make that up? That's true. So Johnny had, you know, uh, there was a way of, he, he definitely got to the ladies. Uh, and then nobody else had that sound. I mean, that's... Uh, and the way he and Strayhorn had a musical relationship that I think, in a way, goes beyond Duke and Johnny. You know, because of how long Johnny had been in the band uh, and done, you know, really great things. But when Billy came in, that's when really these things that were written for Johnny, that was pretty much, I mean, there were signs of that in the, before Billy came up, but, but take Passion Flower, which is the first one. I mean, that, it's a, it, it's a unique piece of music. It doesn't sound like anything else in the annals of jazz, uh, and it's perfect for Hodges, and the way he plays on that is something that he'd never done before the passion in that. Uh, there was a critic named Paul Edward Miller, uh, who was an early downbeat guy, he was a very good record reviewer. He was from Chicago. He was, he was also involved in the early Esquire jazz books. Remember those the big, oversized, beautiful photographs? He said about Passion Flower, he says that Hodges plays with green-tinged fervor. <laughs> he was big into each, he, he, Paul Edward Miller, he, he attempted to create an aesthetic of jazz, you know, so that's where the green tinge comes in. Anyhow, Passion Flower, you know, and Daydream, and, uh, and you know. Warm Valley. Warm Valley is Ellington. Okay. Yeah, so that's a precedent. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that's special for Johnny. The director, Jeep's Blues is another one, although that's like a natural for for Johnny. And there are others, but but Strayhorn, that was a, a special thing. And uh, uh, in the uh, in the Shakespearean suite, what is it? But which is a pickup from an earlier recorded Strayhorn thing. Uh, what is it called? It's the prettiest ballad in the... Star-crossed uh, Lovers. Yeah, the Star-crossed Lovers. That was called Pretty Girl originally. It's recorded on a, one of the Strayhorn LPs. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this, this, uh, that was a special thing with Johnny. And I was at a st Stanley dance when he was producing records for, for Feldstead. I think. Uh, one of them was with Johnny who couldn't be the leader because he was on the contractor, so it was under Strayhorn's name, and Strayhorn was on piano for the session, and I was there, and once again, you know, you got a little taste of, which you didn't have 
because Billy was always on hand at the Ellington recording sessions, but he kept on the sidelines, and once in a while, he and Duke would have a conversation off to the side, but he was very, you know, uh, he was very discreet. But in this particular case, uh, he was really he was really the leader, and Johnny did not want to be that. So anyway, you got a little taste of how how good Strayhorn was. Also, and I was annoyed with Stanley about that. There is one thing you 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 know this record anyway. There is a, a fast piece that do this starts out with after the starts out with a piano solo and Billy was really in form you know it's a fast thing and he played this different from most of the things that he did he did only one chorus I said well, you know but saying you think as soon as I heard that no give him another chorus man you know he's really on no reaction no no sign of anything well you know but that was a pity because that was really he was he, he was really on it Billy never, you know, really never appeared in public. And I, once it was the Ellington Society that, that managed to talk him into doing a concert as the leader under his own name. And it was in the afternoon and it was at the New School. Again, I, I did a review of it so I can refresh my memory. But it turned out that Billy was really terrific as as a leader and he was always reluctant to do this in public but he did just fine and it was a small band with Clark Terry and Bob Wilbur was in place of Johnny Hodges <laughs> Bobby who I think today or yesterday turned 90 uh, was a remarkable I wouldn't want to call it imitator. He was a remarkable. He could evoke them. Yes, he was a reinterpreter. He could do almost anything. I mean, sometimes he would really floor me when I haven't seen him in a while. So all of a sudden, you know, he picks up the tenor and he's doing a true belly. <laughs> I've heard him do a true belly before. You know, he had an amazing sense of. He was like a chameleon. He's a musical chameleon. Uh, he had his own thing, but that was a talent. So he was in this small group, and of course Billy was playing piano. I forget who the rhythm section was. It was a wonderful concert, so, you know, he, he Billy could do things on his own. I think he did a couple, too, at the Hickory House. Uh, but anyway, I mean, he was uh, reticent. And of course we now know it's why, I mean, people in the business they were, knew that he was gay. I mean, there was, but there was a time when that was, you know, something. Only one in the band ever to make anything of that was Barney Begard. He apparently, you know, had a prejudice there, but only one. He's the only one who ever even, you know, had anything to say about that. So, anyway, Johnny Hodges, so Johnny, you know, I mean, he, uh, there was always that moment, you know, when Duke would say, and now Johnny Hodges, you know, and that, that would be, you know, one of the high points of whatever performance it was. And it just a sound, you know, just one note out of his horn, you know, that was it. Uh, nobody has ever come. You know what Charlie Parker called him? Lily Pons. In case you don't know, Lily Pons was a great coloratura soprano. Uh, 